Come on, Mark. John chapter 20. We've been doing a uh, Men and Women of the Bible series. And we've been trying to focus on lesser known men and women of the Bible. Amen? Uh, we've all heard series on David and Paul and, of course, uh, all the great heroes, Moses, of the Bible. Uh, but we've been trying to study out some of the lesser known ones. And prayerfully, the series has been a blessing to you. Amen? How long will the series go on? I don't know. But uh, I'm having a lot of fun studying it out, amen? And in John chapter 20, we're going to study out the Apostle Thomas today. In John 20 and verse 24, the scripture says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Top of the lesson is Thomas, the demon of doubts. You ever doubted? How many of us have doubted the Bible's the word of God? Okay, a lot of you are lying, amen. I, I mean, you ever have those times, even me being a disciple, has been times I've been like, no, what if this is all just... Thing, you know, or what if aliens existed and somehow put the Bible, this is some kind of experiment, or we're in the matrix, and you're like, you're going to be like, I haven't had those doubts, amen. <laughs> but maybe you've doubted other things, amen. Maybe you've doubted the resurrection of Christ. Maybe you've doubted the church. Maybe you've doubted different moves of the Spirit in your life. Maybe you have doubted the sincerity of your relationships. And a lot of times, there are reasons to doubt. A lot of times, people are not trustworthy. Are you with me right here? And sadly, Thomas, throughout history, has always been known as Doubting Thomas. But as we study today, you're going to find out that it's honestly kind of sad he's been labeled with that because he was actually a really awesome disciple of Jesus. And you're going to find all the other apostles had the same doubt. Are you with me right here? And so we learn right away that Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve selected by Jesus. And remember, guys, this wasn't like Jesus just like randomly rolled some dice and chose the twelve. These were, out of thousands of people that had followed Jesus, Jesus specifically chose these men because he knew the potential that they had to change the world. And so, right away, for Thomas to be a part of a group like the Twelve, we know that he had to have been an awesome man of God, for Jesus had spent all night on the mountain praying who he would choose. Go to John chapter 11, and we'll be introduced here to Thomas. In John chapter 11, and verse 4, the context is the death of Lazarus, who was close to Jesus. And Jesus, of course, was close to his family, Mary and Martha there. And in verse 4, when they hear this, it says in verse 4, when they, he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you. And yet, you are going to go back? Well, drop down, eventually what happens is he kind of waits for a while, um, and Lazarus had died, and he tells them Lazarus has fallen asleep. And the disciples go, oh, wow, okay, he's asleep. That, that's probably a good thing, you know? If you're sick, he gets some sleep. He goes, guys, he's dead. And he waits a few days just to make sure, I mean, he's really dead to glorify God through the miracle. And they're afraid because Jesus goes, hey, we're going to go back to Judea and Jerusalem. And they're like, what are you thinking, Jesus? They tried to stone you and kill you there. Now, look at Thomas's response in verse 16. Then Thomas also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him, amen? Our first point is the courage of Thomas. All the other disciples are afraid. They're trying to talk Jesus out of going back to Jerusalem. But Thomas goes, guys, not only am I ready to die, but he tries to inspire the others to have courage. You know, as brothers and sisters, we need to inspire each other to be bold in our faith to be courageous and not shame 
name of Jesus Christ, amen. Who here is a Christian? Amen. See, we can't be ashamed of the name Christian as we go out there and we carry our Bibles, as we preach Jesus' name in an ever-changing culture. That is against what we are doing. We need to be bold. In fact, we need to be willing to die for Christ. He didn't fear the Jews. And it takes a lot of faith to be willing to die for Jesus, yeah. to follow him into his death. I think sadly sometimes we want a, a comfortable Christianity. And we, we have a false view of what America has defined as Christianity. And you go to many churches and, and the message is live your best life now. And, you know, everything's going to be great. And you're going to be rich if you become a Christian. Yeah. And you're going to have all this stuff. And that's not what we see here in the scriptures. Right. Yeah. And we forget that our Lord, who we follow, who we confessed at our baptism, Jesus is Lord, died a brutal death and suffered persecution. If we're following Jesus, what do you think might happen to you? Now, we can praise God for his blessings. I believe, as our slogan says, that Christ comes to bring light to the world. But this is an inner peace that comes only by the Holy Spirit. That, that we can walk with the Lord. And, and Thomas goes, I'm willing to die with you, Jesus. I put before you that fear and doubt are sisters to one another. We doubt going to church. How many people have doubted going to church because of past experiences? Whether it's pedophilia in the Catholic Church or maybe a minister stepped down and, and because he was had a moral failing in his life. And how many people do you meet out there that go, I just don't want anything to do with this? Because they doubt the sincerity of the people. Yeah. I don't want to go to a place of hypocrites. How many people experience death and loss and they doubt God? And they go, God can't exist. How would he let this tragedy happen? Some of us struggled with that when Fat passed away in our church. I mean, a young man, 18 years old. And the question comes, God, why? Why? Fear plays a part because it's unknown. And all fear deals with either your past or your future. Yeah. And God wants us to be present with him. Yeah. And when you're present with Jesus, you go, I'm willing to die with Jesus. <laughs> what are you afraid of because of your past? Maybe you're, you're I'm afraid of a committed relationship. I'm afraid to really date that, that brother or that sister or to find a significant other because I grew up and I just saw the heartache at home between my parents and my dad. We've allowed them the past to define where we're at spiritually at that moment. I'll never conquer the sin. I've just given up. There are times in my life where I felt like I couldn't conquer certain things and I actually compromised. Like, is it really a sin? And start doubting the word of God. Um, I just want to put before you, what if you were like Thomas and you just lived with no fear. Yes. Come on. What would your life look like today? If you walked out these doors and said, I'm done worrying about what people think about me. I'm willing to die for Christ. And isn't it interesting that the Lord has given us and the New England churches the responsibility of evangelizing the Middle East. A place you could actually die for in the gospel. Yeah. As I said, you want to be on these first seven mission teams, amen? Because these cities are awesome. I mean, I went to Dubai, I was like, nothing like I thought the Middle East was. You know what I'm talking about? This is an incredible place. And a lot of you are going to see it at the Middle East Missions Conference. Oh, and so, uh, Bahrain, incredible. They call it like the Las Vegas of the Middle East. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't understand why you wouldn't be fired up about going on these missions. But at some point, someone's going to have to go yeah. to Afghanistan. Yeah. Someone's going to have to go to Iraq. Yeah. And you know, are you willing to follow Jesus even to death? Wow. That's a great question. You know, I find that we forget that Thomas was a bold man. Now, we'll talk about his doubt here in a little bit. But isn't this what we decided when we got baptized? Yeah. That we would die with Christ. Yeah. And isn't that what baptism is? Yeah. A death with Christ. Go to John 14. Let's look at the next place we find Thomas here. Oh, As we see the courage of Thomas, and here we're going to see a lot of the humility of Thomas. In John 14, in verse 1, 
a very comforting passage. In John 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And a comforting passage. You know, no matter what's going on in your life this week, you got to think, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. And Jesus has prepared a place for us. And part of how we overcome fear and doubt and we're willing to die for Jesus in this life is we remember that true Christians as Lazarus don't really die. They live forever. We just go to another age. Amen. Amen. And Jesus is going to come and get us. And he says, you know where a place I'm going? Well, verse 5, Thomas said to them, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Well, Thomas asked this question, which ties into what we read earlier. He wants to follow Christ, even to his death. And so from his standpoint, he's still thinking like, we're talking like physically going somewhere. You know what I mean? Like, well, are we going to Judea or how do we know? I don't know where you're going, Jesus. What are you talking about? Just like, no, you know where I'm going. You're, I'm going back to heaven, amen? <laughs> and he goes, here's the thing. The way to get to heaven is only through Christ. Yeah. Only through Christ. I'm here to tell you that Christianity is an exclusive religion. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus loves inclusive. He loves every single person. And we need to love every single person. Yeah. But he goes, no one will come to God unless they do it Jesus' way. They live Jesus' life, and they preach Jesus' truth. Are you with me right here? And so this excludes anybody that, yes, I believe in God. I don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. You know, in uh, Romans chapter 6, if you'll turn there. What is Jesus' way? How do we die with Christ? There are many world religions out there. All of them teach that you have to climb a ladder to get to God. Whether it's praying a certain amount of times every day, whether it's sacraments, whether it's a state of euphoria through meditative practices, all religions teach something you need to do to get to God. But the thing that's amazing about Christianity is that God came to earth and became one of us, experienced our challenges and our temptations and our struggles, and he comes down to meet you where you're at and forgive you of your sins and make you claim it. You can't share your faith enough to earn your way to heaven. You can't study the Bible with enough people to get you to heaven. And I've had so many times, too many Christians have a performance-based mentality about the Lord. And then we wonder why we're insecure every day about if we're going to heaven or not. Jesus is the way, and he wouldn't have to come and die if you can make it on your own. Yeah. That's the grace of our God. You've you got to believe in him, and you got to die with him. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Oh, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Listen, you know, when we sin, God's grace is there. I I'm fired up about God's grace. But he goes, you know what? In response, should we just keep sinning then? We just live some ungodly life? In verse 2, by no means. I like the J.B. Phillips translation. It says, guys, the thought. <laughs> we are those who have died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ raised him from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Amen. Amen. You know, baptism was our decision to participate in the death of Jesus. Yeah. At that point, you died. You know, I think sometimes we, we come off the cross. Yeah. And when we come off the cross, we don't allow our new spirit man to live. Because that's what Jesus wants to, to do. He wants the flesh to stay on the cross, but Christ wants to live through us. Yeah. Disciples, prior to baptism, we all count the cost of being willing to die for the Lord. Yeah. And listen, a dead man can't negotiate. 
the terms. A dead man can't, you know, go, well, I'll, I'll come into the kingdom, but here is the qualifications that I have on my side. We know Luke 14 that the two armies that go to war, the terms of peace need to be total surrender. Right there. Come on, bro. And when you're dead at baptism, you understand, man, I deserve death for my sins. I mean, to this day, guys, I just go, man, man, you actually appreciate the grace of God more. The longer I'm a Christian, the more wicked I see my sin. But then it allows me, I don't stay there because that's where Satan can come. Come on, bro. I go, oh, man, thank you for the grace that's been poured into me. It makes me more grateful for my Lord, more grateful for Jesus Christ. Yeah. And man, I'm still here, even though I've left the Lord so many times in my heart. Okay. And sometimes we see restorations up here. We go, oh, man, this person's coming back to God. I go before you that many of us have been restored over and over and over again. Yeah. And because we've all sinned in various ways, and we need to have a conviction. Now, if you're studying the Bible, you need to die with Christ. Many people got baptized. If you were like me, I got baptized as a child when I was like in fourth grade. Yeah. They said it was an outward sign of an inward grace. Uh, many churches thought baptismal services on a Sunday, once a month, or on Easter, and you can sign up to be baptized. Don't check anything about your life. Don't ask about repentance. Right. Just all, you know, come and we're good to go. <laughs> and that is not dying. Right. Baptism is a death. I've given up my agenda for my life. And now Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is on the throne. I think what happens over time is we sin, we get sinned against, and we forget that Jesus died and entitlement creeps in. When you were baptized, did you go, okay, I'll get baptized as long as I'm a Bible talk leader. I'll get baptized as long as I get to be nice to see you. I'll get baptized as long as I get a girlfriend and a Christian spouse. I'll get baptized as long as you don't ask too much from me. Wow. As long as I don't have to, to give financially to God. None of us did that. Right. But what happens as you get older as a Christian is we come off the cross. And, and we start struggling with these very things. We feel entitled to things. Yes. And it hurts our Lord. You know, yeah, maybe you aren't called to die for Jesus physically. But what fear do you just need to kill in your life? Believe is a choice. I, you know, we study the Bible with atheists sometimes. But I just can't believe. No, you choose not to believe. Right. Yeah. Doubt and belief is a choice. Yeah. Say, so how do you know that? Revelation 21, verse 8. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the adulterers, those who practice sorcery will all find their place in the hell. Right. Yeah. Says the lake of fire. That's an intense passage. And what's intense about that is we go, oh yeah, all those sexual moral people and all the, you know, those who are practicing witchcraft and worshiping Satan. The cowardly and the unbelieving. And you know what's great about being in the new covenant is even if you're cowardly and unbelieving, the, the grace of God can forgive you and make you bold. Yes. It can make you bold and it can make you strong. And if we want our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we have to have been baptized. Yeah. We have to have died with Christ, so that we can live. Amen. Amen. Well, Thomas would fail. And isn't it encouraging that you have failures in the Bible? Yeah. I'm so grateful it's not like the Quran or something, so listen to me. Like, it's not just like, you know, only about Jesus. You know, it was just Jesus, and that was it. And you're like, oh, man, this is impossible. I don't know about you, I'm kind of grateful for the other guys. Yeah. Jesus is number one, amen, I'm not saying that. But, 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 but all the other guys, I look at it and go, praise God, don't you love that? that, that I, I mean, I'll be honest, I'll say a bold statement here. Don't you love that David, like, really blew <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like anytime I really blow it, I go, well, I've never murdered anybody, and I've never committed adultery, so I'm in a good spot, amen? <laughs> Didn't hide it forever, you know what I'm saying? Like, like that's encouraging. Yeah. Let the Bible encourage you. So we're going to look at Thomas here, who blows it, not to the extent David did, amen, but, but blows it, and in some ways, in a different way, that is pretty intense. Because uh, it denies who really Jesus was in some ways. Or it doubts it, I should say. Um, this is our second point here. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. This is a hard one. Um, you know, I really blew it when I was young, younger. Um, gosh, back uh, I was out of college. I was single. Uh, 
uh, went through some church discipline. And one of the challenges for me was that people didn't really trust me for a while. Yeah. And it was kind of like this reputation just kind of was with me, you know what I mean? And, and, and I wanted to, they need to trust me, they need to forgive me. That's what the Bible says. And I realized that it's not my place to do that when I'm the one who sinned. I can't be entitled to people's forgiveness because what do I deserve because of my sin? Yeah. And so it's grace that I'm just alive. But oftentimes we want to kind of, it's like, you know, someone punching their spouse and then going, forgive me. I just messed up. Well, I just messed up. Just forgive me. Well, that's ridiculous. There's, there's pain there. And there's healing. There may need to be consequences of moving out and separate or whatever. You get what I'm saying? Ecclesiastes chapter 10. So why am I saying all this? Well, in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. One bad decision in your life can totally tarnish your reputation for life. Totally tarnish your reputation. Thomas, why, what do we know him as? Doubting Thomas. I mean, you're going to get to heaven, he's going to be like, I know, I know, I know. You know what I mean? Like, 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 man. But one choice, even though he went on to do great things, historically evangelized India, I mean, an incredible man of God. But one bad choice for history, he's known as Downing Thomas. A little folly can ruin your reputation. Now, some things won't. You know, you mess up in smaller ways. Uh, you know, praise God, people moved on and forgave me and different things. But you can make one bad decision that ruins your life. I mean, guys, think about it. You know preachers who have failed in massive ways, even in our fellowship, and what do you think about every time you think of them? It doesn't matter how well they do, how particular they get to preach, and they're doing great things. And it's just the consequences of sin. You know, think about King David. What do we remember? I mean, a man after God's own heart, but we also remember the time he blew it, the adulterer. In Psalm 51, verse 3, David said, My sin is always before me. And oftentimes when we mess up, we just don't want it to be for us. We are like, come on, get over it. That was fast. Move on. What if you change your perspective to go, this consequence is in my life because it's the grace of God, so I'll never do it again. Amen. Come on, bro. That, that's the grace of God. Um, gosh, when you think of Bill Clinton, what do you think of I mean, I'm not going to get into it here because we're mixed up. But... I mean, gosh, he served as president for eight years, guys. I'm sure you don't become president without being some type of great leader. And I'm not getting into politics, whatever you think about that. I'm just saying you're not going to get in that position if you have some kind of great leadership ability. And it's so sad. You know, I was on Facebook, uh, gosh, I don't remember what it was, a couple of weeks ago. You know, you got these ads that kind of pop up. And one pops up with Bill Clinton. And it's a, a mastery class on leadership from Bill Clinton. And he's there talking about how you're going to lead. And I was like, oh, i got to click the comments here. So. <laughs> and you know the comments. I love the comments. You always have that one guy at the top that says something really funny. And you're just like, man, people are hilarious, you know? But I saw all the ha-ha faces, you know what I mean, on there. And I was kind of like, it's going to be good. And, and you know, not the main thing where you should have been there. But, but I was reading through these things. And it was just so sad because... This guy has just tarnished his legacy. Now listen, if I told you, hey, this afternoon, Bill Clinton's going to come and teach us um, skills about leadership and stuff, uh, we'd probably be fired up, like honestly. Yeah. I'd be like, hey, there's some things he could teach us, and, and, and we could learn about nothing spiritual, but leadership, amen? <laughs> and you'd, be, you'd probably go to it. And I bet there are people that signed up for that class. But his legacy's going to be known yeah. as what he did in the White House. Right. And that's just the fact about it. So some mistakes are big, and, and because Thomas doubted the resurrection of Christ, this determined his legacy. Wow. You know, for most of us in here, we haven't tarnished our legacy, amen? amen. And, and I want to inspire you today not to tarnish it. One bad choice could totally determine the course of the legacy you leave behind. Wow. Doesn't mean there's no forgiveness and that God doesn't love you. And listen, if you've made one bad choice that's tarnished your reputation, your legacy, Maybe there's a criminal offense you have to carry with you the rest of your life, or, or, or whatever it might be. I want to encourage you, get working for the Lord. Yeah. And when you get to heaven, they're like, oh, you're that guy that, that, that did this. And you go, well, hey, listen, look, I have more rewards around here because I got up and I worked hard for God. Yeah. I worked hard for the Lord. 
And now point number three as we close. Destroying the demon of doubt. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder back in uh, 2012. It's an anxiety disorder. And uh, no, I don't wash my hands over and over again and all that. But but uh, that's kind of the stereotypical thing about OCD. But OCD is known as what they call the doubting disease. And for years, I was I had this, this scrupulosity where I just had these constant doubts and thoughts about, you know, am I really saved or not? And did I confess enough sin? Did I do enough right? And I was just constantly plagued with obsessive compulsive thinking that got to a place that I literally thought I would have to like check myself into a, a, you know, a hospital or something. Yeah. You go read, I wrote a book about it, you go read about it if you want. But the reality was, is it was really tough and challenging uh, for me to overcome. And many Christians, they battle constant doubts. They doubt uh, their salvation. They doubt God's plans for their lives. They doubt the church and the motives of others. Um, I think they overthink naturally. Anyone in here an overthinker? I am. Sometimes I can I can get like a text message or something, and I'm like, why was that even changed? <laughs> You ever say the Bible to someone like, well, why haven't they responded yet? That, yeah. Like, maybe it's persecution. You're just wicked. And they're like, oh, I lost my phone, you know. Like, you text them like a hundred times or something that really weird them out. That's like OCD type kind of stuff, you know what I mean? You're just like super obsessive, compulsive about everything and insecure. Why did she say that? Why? I've had people come up and say, say, you know, people have come to me, you looked at me weird in the fellowship. And they thought I was like disappointed with them. Or something like that. Like, I don't even remember that. It's probably off when I had a daydream or something. You know? <laughs> uh, but these are things we, we, we struggle with if we're honest. Yeah. Um, we watch something like GNN and we go, like, how come I wasn't mentioned with that? You know? <laughs> I mean, I got to confess this in, guys. I, 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 the, 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 uh, when the, the GNN came out, I like fast forwarded to the parts I was mentioned. <laughs> So there's a lot of things that kind of allude to church, if you will, in the book of John. So the statement on the first day of the week, what's that to remind us of? Sunday. And in Revelation, which is also written by John the Apostle, chapter 1, they call this the Lord's Day. So maybe you've heard that before. Sunday's called the Lord's Day because it's the day he resurrected. And so he set this up to almost be like a church service, if you will, or like a fellowship when you understand uh, what we're going to read. So in verse 19, it says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You know, this is pretty awesome. This is John's version of the Great Commission. And he says, I'm sending you to receive the Spirit. He breathes on them, which would remind us, and John draws a lot of allusions from the book of Genesis, it would remind us of when God breathed life in the yeah. And he breathes on them and commissions them and goes, go. And of course, they're to go to Jerusalem and receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And he says, anyone you forgive will be forgiven. Of course, 
they're commissioned to go and make disciples, and as you baptize people, they're forgiven of their sins, yeah. amen. Yeah. And of course, the apostles have the authority to permit forgiveness in church discipline when you read about this in like 1 Corinthians 5. But when we look at this passage, we see that the disciples are together. Yeah. And there's one missing. Look in verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Uh-oh. He missed church. Wow. Missed the wow. evening service there. Wow. And the disciples, they're living in fear of the Jewish leaders, and, you know, they're, they're kind of together, the Bible says, together, they're fellowshipping. And what happens? Well, Jesus appears to them, and he gives them peace and shows the marks yeah. of the crucifixion. And the Bible says the disciples are overjoyed, and they're fired up. And then he imparts to them peace. He imparts to them the commission of the Holy Spirit. And again, there's different views on this passage on whether he actually gave them the indwelling of the Spirit there. That's a possibility. Or whether he was saying, wait for it in Jerusalem. That's a possibility. It doesn't really matter. He's making the point like he's imparting to them this peace that we know comes from the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting is Thomas isn't here. And then we read, of course, in verses 25 and on, Thomas doubts. Yeah. So what do we learn here on how to overcome doubt? Come to church. Yeah. Come to church. You need fellowship. Think about what the disciples received and what Thomas missed. Thomas, the disciples received peace. Don't we need peace after a hectic week? Yeah. I mean, gosh, it can be hellacious out there. Yeah. And man, it's getting harder and harder. Prices going up, gas, I mean, we get beat up by the world, beat up by your boss at work and stuff. And they're starting to go, oh, and then you come to church. Right. You're reminded of God. Amen. And you're reminded of eternity. Yeah. We're not living for this Woo. life. And you need that peace, amen. Yeah. And secondly, what did they receive? Joy. Verse 26, yeah. they were overjoyed. Man, I, I, I don't know about you, there's been times I've been depressed. And for me, for some reason, it's always around midweek. I always just like, you know, Wednesday night. I'll be honest, I'm a preacher, but I don't even feel like going to midweek sometimes. And I'm just like, and I drag myself there, you know, and, and you know, come in, and I see the brothers. And, and we start fellowshipping. And then, you know, that was like thinking, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're just fired up. You know, sometimes you've got to drag your butt to church. And get in there, and the joy comes because you're just excited. What else did they receive? The Holy Spirit. The power of the Spirit. Jesus appeared to them. I believe this is symbolic for us, as John's writing to the church, as I said. It's symbolic for us that Jesus is going to reveal himself to you. When you come to church, why? Because the church is the body of Christ. And we've lost the reverence for God's church. It's the most holy institution created. Amen. I'm not talking about the general organization. I'm talking about anyone who's a baptized disciple of Jesus Christ is part of the most holy institution on the planet. Amen. And sometimes we treat our jobs with more honor and revere them than we do the church. Amen. Oh, I got this, this sniffle, so I'm not going to come to church. <laughs> but you go to work that day. Amen. And listen, I'm just telling you, I want the joy that God is going to give. Yeah. And if you want another verse for this, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 and 13, teaches that we drink from the Spirit when we're part of the body of Christ. Part of the body of Christ. Number four, what did Thomas miss that everyone else received there? His marching order. They're marching orders. Go. I'm commissioning you. You know, we come to church to get our marching orders, if you will. But what are we directed to do by God? What, what, what are we going to do to go out and make disciples? How are we going to learn to be more effective for the Lord and, and do His work here on earth? Don't you get fired up that you have a purpose? Yes. Everyone gets baptized for different reasons. They come in, they say a cute girl or something. Like, oh, okay, maybe I'll join this church or whatever. And some people, they, they come and they, you know, they see the, 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 the group and they're like, maybe they have no friends or something in the world. They come and they go, oh, I can have friends now, you know. Or may, maybe maybe they, 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 they love the singing or something. For me, I didn't want to go to hell, amen? <laughs> Uh, for whatever reason, my mom freaked me out about how I love you, mom. I know you watch, but, but it, it, you know, told me some scary stories about ghosts and things like that. I go, I don't want to go to hell. Yeah. And praise God for my mom warning me about hell because I became a disciple. Amen. Yeah. But you know the other thing that fired me up about becoming a Christian? 
purpose. Yeah. What do you live for every day? I mean, think about your best time as a Christian right now. Yeah. Look back at your life. before, And, and, and isn't it when you've been in there at coffee shops with people? Yeah. Opening up the Bible, watching people free of drugs and finding purpose in their life and free from their sin. And man, so many people, they see the word of God, they move out from living with their partner, they change their lifestyle. We've seen all kinds of people become Christians. Yeah. It's amazing, and you get to be used by God to do this, oh, wow. to be commissioned to forgive sins. What an incredible blessing. Yeah. And ultimately, they miss Jesus showing up and miss the faith that, Thomas missed the faith that he could have had wow. to believe. You know, Thomas missed out on all this. Yeah. I think it's worthy of pointing out, Jesus didn't appear to the Lone Ranger Christian Thomas. Right. Doesn't appear to the, the guy that's out there, and sadly, so many people have doubts in the church. You meet them. Oh, well, I'm against organized religion. Me and Jesus are really tight, though. I'm a church. Have you ever heard stuff like this? Go, well, I know you've never read the Bible. Right. And secondly, you're not going to be able to experience the joy and the peace and the marching orders that the mission has. Oh, let's go, yeah. Oh. God. Amen. Yes. Why wasn't Thomas there? I think this is worthy of thinking about. Yeah. I'm speculating a little bit here. But it's interesting because what did Thomas not fear earlier? Who did he not fear specifically? Do you remember? The Jews. What did they all fear? Why were they gathered here and locked in this house? The Jews. Because I think Thomas was maybe like, these guys are cowards. I'm out here on my own. They're not in me. Like, like, I mean, it makes sense that we read the Bible. And gosh, that's like thinking you're superior than everyone else. I'm not going to go to church because they're all a bunch of sinners or whatever. You ever hear stuff like this? That's like, you know, I'm not going to go to the gym because there's not a lot of out of shape people there. Or something. What are you talking about? Like, of course we're sinners. We're imperfect. And listen, we didn't plant this church to build like the perfect church in town. We built this church to honor God yeah. and to come and bear our imperfections. And yet so many people out there think they're superior to everyone else. Yeah. And they church hop and church hop. And you know what happens? Every time they go to a church, they don't like something. Right, yeah. They get hurt by somebody. If you're visiting with us this morning, you're not going to like something today. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to life. <laughs> What if you changed your mindset to go, you know something? I'm imperfect too. Yeah. And yeah. man, these people, they're out to honor God. They're going to trip and fall as we do it. Yeah. I make mistakes. Yeah. Sometimes I preach things wrong and someone has pointed out or whatever. Some historical facts wrong or whatever, you know. Amen. But I praise God that we get to come and that the Holy Spirit works despite our imperfections. Yeah. So to destroy the demon of doubt, you need to be in fellowship. Yeah. You know, are you committed to a small group in the church? Like, how uh, is this supposed to be? It's work. Are you committed to your Bible talk? Uh, it's a family. You know, yeah. we have to do more than most people as disciples. Mm-hmm. It's a fact. You know what I mean? You get off work. What do most people get to do? Go home and catch the new Grace Anatomy or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and that's not um, they they, they want to just veg out and it's what they do and wait for the weekend to maybe go hit the bar or party a little bit or whatever and start the week again. For many, it's just their, their kids become their life. Yeah. And listen, my, you know, my daughter is my life, amen? Yeah. But Jesus comes before my daughter. Yeah. And Jesus comes before my wife. Yeah. Some people worship their, their family. Okay. Come on, bro. And, and, and it, it, it kills them. It kills them. Are you committed to a small group? Come on, you know, in John 20, in verse 24. On, now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were. Put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Is that just stubborn or what? Yeah. 
I mean, he'd have a hard time being converted now, you know what I mean? Like, this time, yeah. right? Like, that, that, that's just a stubborn heart. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. I find it interesting that a week went by. I don't know why I'd be curious anyone's thoughts on that. I was trying to think through that in the book of life, but, you know, just interesting. Let's figure it out. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And, of course, we believe Jesus is not only the Son of God, but he's God as well, amen? Amen. And this is one of the best texts to really prove that. My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Amen, brothers and sisters. You guys are blessed this morning. Blessed. Blessed. And happiness is not like the happiness we get because, you know, we won our sports game at school or or we're excited or whatever. Those are all temporary happiness. Happiness surpasses circumstances. Even Jesus was biblically happy on the cross because he had the peace of God with him that had been imparted. You know, Thomas finally believes here. And what's Jesus say? Stop down. Yeah. It's a command. Stop down and believe. I thought about things that are hard for us to believe in our time. I think the Bible is one of them. But have you studied it out? If you have doubts about the Bible this morning, have you looked into the prophecies of Jesus? Have you looked into the prophecies about Israel, and the kingdom of God, and everything God's done? And I believe the Bible supernaturally proves itself. I mean, there's just things that you go, oh my gosh. The resurrection of Christ. You know, maybe for you, you can doubt things that God's promised you, that you can bear much fruit, that you can personally baptize someone. Listen, there's no timetable for this. But but, but you've got to remain in Jesus and believe his promises. So often we read John 15 and we think that, you know, i got to go out and bear fruit. I'm trying really hard. Remain in Christ. Yeah. Just be close to the Lord. And it looks different for everybody, amen? It looks different for everybody. Some people are out there, you know, street preaching like Manny out there, you know. Uh, some people are the kind, you know, I mean, they go, I go on campus and they just hit every table talking to people. Some people, they have a full-time job and they're reaching out to their family and they're helping their kids become disciples. Some people are helping their families become Christians. Some people are out there they're driving through the drive through at the grocery store. You can't look down on anyone. We just need to be about the mission. And we need to believe the promise. That the promise is that there will be much fruit. So stop doubting and believe. Special missions contribution. That one's easy to doubt, isn't it? I've been around for a long time. People are like, oh, I don't like it. Well, because it requires something from us. So, of course, that's going to be the one I doubt. You know what I'm talking about? You're going to like, that's a... That's challenging. And money is where your heart is, Jesus yeah. said, right? Where your treasure is, there your, your heart is. So uh, we got to understand that we need to believe. Yeah. And listen, I believe with all my heart that as we sacrifice, you're going to see the results and the fruit, as we'll see today. Um, that we can believe, we need to believe that we can achieve personal goals we have. Maybe you want to get in shape. Maybe you want to start a business. Do you believe God is actually into everything in your life? Not just church and what we call ministry. You know ministry is your job. Ministry is your academics. Ministry is your life. And the talents and the gifts. And I think sometimes we're like, oh, I'm only in the ministry if I'm in ICCM or whatever. Dude, that is such a demonic thought. Because everyone's a minister for God. And it looks different for everybody. You know, um, I want to point out a a few things. Hang in there with me. Oh, I'm actually good on time. Feels like I've been up here for a long time. All right, go back to chapter 28. Put on your seatbelts for another hour. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Matthew 28. I want to show you real quick that Thomas wasn't the only one who struggled with this. Stuff. And by the way, the sermon's going to function as our communion today. In Matthew 28 and verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but saw what? That's what we don't really pay attention to a lot. We're like, we have this mindset that they were ready, you know what I mean? Some doubt. So we know it wasn't just Thomas. 
Verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Amen. So we find that not only going to fellowship helps us to overcome and destroy the demon of hell, but also obedience to Jesus' commission. For he says, as we're making disciples, what's the promise? I will be with you always to the very end of the age. I don't know about you, but when I sit in a Bible study, and I can be having a hard week, and feel like, did God leave me or something, or whatever, satanic thoughts, and I get a Bible study, I see the word cut someone else's heart. I see them confess their sin, and, and they're moved by the Spirit. And, and man, don't you walk away just like, God is powerful. Yes. And I think it's amazing, Jesus doesn't really address the doubts. That encourages me. It's okay to have doubts sometimes. Yeah. But it's not okay to just sit in it. Right. Yeah. And Jesus is going, you've got to get out there and you'll know I'm with you always. That's how you overcome doubt. I tell atheists this all the time. I say, listen, if you want to know if God's real or not, you've got to start practicing what he teaches. Yeah. And as you practice what he teaches, God is going to validate himself in your life. Yeah. You know, when you look at the book of Acts, the disciples are just out in the streets preaching. They're out. I mean, the Holy Spirit works when you are out, out in the streets preaching. There's this false idea that the Holy Spirit come, we, you know, turn, dim the lights down and play all this music. And, man, Christian did a good job. We went back a cappella today, man. That was pretty awesome. Oh, pretty Josh, yeah. Josh, our uh, worship director, is in um, Philly today, man. I thought all the guys did a great job leading our, our singing. But that's not just when the Holy Spirit shows up. Yeah. It shows up when we're out preaching and God is validating that he's with us. Now go back to John chapter 21 here. And we'll look at the last place John's mentioned. In John 21, in verse 2. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Verse 2 says, Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out that, and got in the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Amen. Amen. You know, ordering is always important in the Bible. Understand that as you uh, interpret the scriptures. So, guess who's always listed number one when all the apostles are listed? Peter. Because Peter was the early church leader, right? And so, interestingly here in John 21, guess who's listed after Peter at this particular point in verse 2? Um, Thomas. So, we know he was a solid dude, amen, in this perspective. But at this point, remember, they had doubted. And so what happens? They return back here, and they're fishing, and they go, hey, let's go fishing, you know. Um, even though Jesus had appeared to them and showed them the marks and stuff, they still hadn't fully been reinstated, or what we might call restored. And what's interesting is that then they don't catch any fish. Well, this is symbolic of the idea. They're not out doing what they're supposed to be doing, fishing for men and making disciples. And so he goes, let the net down on the other side, and they catch so many that they can't even haul it in, and they realize it's Jesus. Now what happens next? Well, Peter realizes it, and he jumps out into the water and swims to Jesus. And I've often thought this speculation, but if you think about it, what was Peter's most significant moment that he ever experienced Walking on water, he would never forget that. I, tend, I like to think that he thought he was going to walk on that water again. But he wasn't right with the Lord yet. Even though they had seen Jesus and believed, they're still not fishing for men. And I believe Peter represents all the apostles here. Represents Thomas's doubt. But, you know, if you're going to restore the group, you've got to restore the leader. And here in John chapter 21 and verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He addresses Peter by his non-Christian name, Simon. 
Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter had denied the Lord three times. But at this point, now had seen the resurrected Lord, but still was not doing what he was supposed to be. And so Jesus asked him, do you love me? Now, I think all of us would say we love God. Yeah. But for Jesus, the litmus test was, are you going to feed my sheep? Then? Are you going to make disciples and take care of them yeah. and feed the people? Peter, I have a mission for you. I gave you the keys. And so in the Greek, he asked him, do you love me? The word for love is agape. It's a self-sacrificing love. Yes, you know that I love you. He asked him again, do you love me, agape? And then he asked him a third time, do you phileo me? It's basically saying, are you even my friend? And Peter was hurt by Jesus. Discipling sometimes will hurt. Usually it's God trying to change us and transform us and help us to grow when it's based on the word of God. Peter had felt miserably, but asked, was asked by Jesus, do you love him? I want you to consider that question this morning. Do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Amen. Maybe you have your quiet time stuff. Do you feed the sheep? Do you feed the sheep? Are you concerned for every single soul in your Bible talk? You pray for them, you care for them, you love them, you serve them. It's not just about only making disciples, it's about taking care of the disciples. And loving them. Is there anything that has caused, if there's anything that's caused people to doubt God and doubt his church, it's being sent against. Yeah. Now, Jesus didn't sin against Peter here. But think about it. How many have doubted the church because of the Crusades? Or doubted the church because of Christians bashing homosexuals or, you know, doing ungodly things yeah. like this? Uh, sadly, people have sinned, and so people get hurt. Now, Hurt undealt with becomes bitterness. Yeah. Hurt undealt with becomes bitterness. That's the, yeah. the natural uh, route that goes. Yeah. And so I want to end by just talking about, is there anybody that you've been hurt by that you need reconciliation with? Uh, two scriptures in Ecclesiastes 10 and Romans 12, 19. These are our last verses that I want to encourage you with on how to overcome and destroy the demon of doubt in our relationships. Um, love always trusts, the Bible says. Yeah. I don't think this means you should entrust yourself to someone who's done something dangerous to you. I'm not a big believer that you're going to be friends with everybody in the church or there are certain people that are just negative and you should stay, around, stay away from them. Yeah. So hear me out. I'm not saying you should. Jesus didn't entrust himself to sinful men either. Right. But understand that Fundamentally, with our brothers and our sisters, when we've been hurt, we have a responsibility to deal with our own bitterness, whether they repent or not. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 4, two verses that, that help with this idea is in verse 4, it says, If a ruler's anger arises against you, do not leave your coats. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. Uh, maybe you're a wife and your husband's anger has come against you. Don't leave your bones as a wife. Be calm, and it can lay anger to rest. Maybe your Bible talk leader's been harsh with you. Be calm. Don't leave God's church. Deal with it. Matthew 18, address your brother. Get help from other more spiritual people. But think about how many people have left the church because of someone's other, someone else's actions. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think sometimes it can be unsafe situations or there's been people 
about that idea. Amen. Move to a different leadership in a different church that teaches the truth. Yeah. But fundamentally, I think most times we need to believe in each other that we all want the, the, the best. Yeah. I was telling the leaders the other day, you know, that I can't remember who I was talking to, but but you know, some some leaders they struggle with being so down on the people they lead and this guy just won't have his wife at home. What would you how do you want to like that? And I'm like, well, do you think they, that he wants to be like that? Like, don't you think every Christian actually really loves God? Yeah. I mean, I'm not worshiping Satan, right? Like, like, don't you think everyone generally wants to share their faith? Don't you think everyone who's a member in our church actually wants to love God? And so we need to understand positive intent and believe that people want to be Christians. We need to believe and have faith in each other and not doubt our brothers and sisters. You know, in Romans 12, the last one. Come on, brother. In Romans chapter 12, and verse 19. Come on, bro. Come on, Mike. When someone hurts us and they don't care, yeah. don't change? You ever had a situation like that? Yeah. yeah. I've had some pretty intense situations. Yeah. I remember uh, when I was in our former fellowship, a, a leader had me in their house and was like, I'm not letting you leave until you're broken. Just like yelling at me in my face, and it was it was really scary for me. And and you know later on, um, there was some harshness. It it it, it made me scared to be open. I can't believe my post. I didn't leave my post. And I understand this passage in Romans twelve verse nineteen. Do not take revenge, my dear friend. But leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. Uh, that guy's falling away. That's not a church. The Lord will deal with you. And it may not be in this lifetime, it may be in the next. But we need to leave room for God's wrath, and we need to let go and forgive and love. Are you with me right here, guys? And so destroy the demons of doubt in your life. You know, Thomas would go along with Peter and feed the sheep. And we know from Acts chapter 1 that he was part of the 120 that built the foundation of the church. Chanel and I had the opportunity to go to Chennai, India. And we stood in the place where Thomas was speared to death. Martyrs. And it was just an incredible feeling. But he went, most likely across Arabia, across the sea to India, and history records that he preached the gospel. And the people of India there, um, because he kept preaching, uh, killed him. And so, truly, he went and died for Jesus. Yeah. Today, as we take communion, I want you to remember the courage of Thomas. And be careful in our lives that one decision can define us in our legacy. But number three, to destroy the demon of doubt in our lives. Here's my, my call from the sermon. Do something courageous this week. Conquer a fear. Write it down what you're going to conquer. And go after it. And let's destroy the demon of doubt. To God be the glory. Amen.